Hey, welcome, buddy, to the King Crocoduck, Ken Hoven Part 3. I'm Steve McCray, host of the Great Debate Community. And I know all of you have been very much excited to look for and looking forward to this. Um, we're going to jump right into it. We're going to give each debater a few minutes to have an opening statement in regards to tonight's topic, which is going to be on radiation and cosmology. This is going to be more of a free form back and forth to debate, and hopefully we'll get some Q and A in at the uh, at the end from the live feed. Uh, King Crocoduck, go ahead and go first with your opening statement, and uh, then we'll go ahead and have Kent give his. All right, thank you, Steve. I want to make sure that everybody can see my screen, so let me check really quickly. Uh, how are we doing? Everybody can see, yeah. It's good on this end. Okay, very good. So I'm going to begin uh, with a little bit of a presentation. I just want to set the scene, uh, make sure that everybody's on the same page about what we are and what we're not talking about today. So this way we end up not wasting any time. So when it comes to the Big Bang Theory, um, this, is what the big, this is what the theory claims. It says that 13.8 billion years ago, the universe expanded from a very hot and dense state into its current cool and sparse one. Um, there's a whole host of predictions associated with this, but this is sort of the general gist of the theory. Um, the theory does not claim, it does not address the origin of space, time, and energy. Um, I realize that there are some popular uh, science, you know, enthusiast websites. There are some kids' books that say that this is the case. In reality, this is, this is not the case. The Big Bang Theory tells us uh, that it, it's addressing how the universe uh, transitioned from, the, from its initial hot and dense state into the current cool and sparse state over the course of 13.8 billion years. Um, so this, 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 this should not come up. And it's not under any obligation to uh, describe this. I have here a graphic of major events since the Big Bang. And you can even see down here the 10 to the minus 43 seconds. There's no point here that says, you know, universe came into existence. That's not the point of the theory. In, in order to be able to probe, you know, this kind of region right here, a 10 to the minus 43 seconds since the initial expansion uh, as calculated, uh, you need things like quantum gravity, and we don't have a theory describing that, you know. Um, but, you know, this is, it's not sufficient grounds to dismiss gravity or quantum mechanics uh, because of some ambiguities in either of these theories. The, the entire scientific enterprise is about uh, covering the gaps, about closing these gaps in our knowledge in order to better understand how the universe functions. Uh, it's a good thing, too, that these gaps exist, otherwise I'd be out of a job. Now, the second thing that the Big Bang Theory does not address is whether the universe has a creator or not. Um, completely irrelevant to the topic under discussion. I have here two people. I have, I'm probably going to butcher his name, Georges Lemaitre. He was a Catholic priest and a physicist. He was the one who came up with the Big Bang Theory. And I have here Fred Hoyle. He was an atheist and a physicist. And he rejected the Big Bang Theory his entire professional career. From 1929, when the theory started to gain traction, when Hubble uh, started to discover the relationship, between redshift and distances of receding galaxies, um, Fred Hoyle um, rejected that immediately, and he continued rejecting it until his death in 2001. And he was an atheist, and in fact, he invented the term Big Bang as a pejorative. Uh, it, was, it was intended to demean the theory. He did it in a BBC interview, and he had this to, to say. He said, the reason why scientists like the Big Bang is because they are overshadowed by the book of Genesis. It is deep within the psyche of most scientists to believe in the first page of Genesis. Um, so anyway, the, the upshot of all this, this is not some kind of atheistic, satanic conspiracy to try to discredit any kind of religion. Um, we subscribe to the Big Bang Theory because it's the best model that we have describing how the universe came to be into it in, its, in its current state. Uh, finally, it does not address why dogs produce dogs. Um, I, I hope we don't waste our time on this nonsense anymore. This is, this is a physics debate, not a biology debate. So, you know, let's stay on topic here. Uh, finally, just a few words about scientific theories. It, uh, the strength of a scientific theory depends on its predictive power, on whether it accurately makes novel, testable predictions about future data. And a bit of a hint here, um, dogs produce dogs is not a novel prediction. Neither is it's going to get wet on the ground when it rains. These are, these are not novel predictions. These, these are things that people have observed since the beginning of time. So, and these are a couple of other uh, criteria, just general uh, rules of thumb for what theories should look like. Um, they have to be potentially falsifiable. So there's some criteria which, if met, would warrant the theory's abandonment. And they have to have explanatory efficiency, or the number of unjustified assumptions minimized. 
It's basically Occam's razor. So anyway, I am here in this debate to make two principal claims using primarily um, what we know about radiation, and in particular, what we know from redshift and especially the cosmic microwave background radiation. My two principal claims are that the Big Bang Theory meets all of these criteria, and that Hoven's model of the universe's development does not meet any of them. So I'm going to turn the mic now to Mr. Hovind, and I'll let him make his opening statement. Turn this wrong button. Did I get it right there? Can you hear me okay? We can hear you just okay. fine. Yeah, we hear you. Well, good. Yeah, these complex systems ought to happen automatically. Uh, well, uh, I th I'm curious about numerous things, I guess. Uh, you call yourself King Crocoduck. Uh, who made you a king, and what's Crocoduck mean? I'd like to know. Maybe you can address that someday. Uh, why did you choose that name, and why do you do this? If if we are indeed nothing but animated meat, uh, a result of a Big Bang, what is your purpose in, I, I'm still baffled on, what are you trying to accomplish here? But you can maybe address that sometime. I mean, so it, if you're right, it, nothing, nothing matters. Uh, nothing matters. So anyway. Okay, I take the position the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. The earth is about, the whole universe is about 6,000 years old. It was created by God, and it is expanding, maybe, uh, based on a red shift, uh, which may not, or may or may not show the universe is expanding. There's articles in the, you can search the internet, you know, does the red shift prove the universe is expanding? And there's quite a controversy still among a variety of people on whether it's expanding or not. I happen to believe it is. But I did a YouTube a couple nights ago uh, that you may want to watch uh, on this topic uh, the, about the red shift. What does that show? If we observe different group, people groups running a certain direction, and we can measure the speed that they're traveling and the direction they're traveling, and the distance they are from a central point, that still would not prove they didn't start running 10 seconds ago, or that they've always run at the same speed, uh, or that they were all crashed into one little tiny dot. You said, <clears throat> I believe I got your quote right here, that the Big Bang Theory, uh, you believe the Big Bang because it's the best model we have. Uh, I think if, if I asked you to explain how computers came to be, but you cannot use man as your example, as your answer. You have to come up with a scientific explanation, excluding man or intelligent designer, and you come up with all kinds of explanations of how computers came to be or how automobiles came to be or any complex thing. A single cell. If you've already excluded the only logical uh, answer uh, by your rules, then of course you're going to be wondering the rest of your life, you know, do you have the right one? This Big Bang Theory is only the latest in a long story uh, of people trying to reject the Creator. They don't want there to be a God. Uh, so I think they are in a tied together. It's interesting you would uh, bring up the ideas uh, and then tell people that we can't talk about that, you know, dogs produce dogs, etc. But you brought it up, so I think it certainly is part of the debate. Uh, for if if your point is that the Big Bang is or the Red Shift is somehow evidence that the universe is billions of years old, I think I would have to uh, uh, disagree completely. There's overwhelming evidence that the Earth is only a few thousand years old, uh, and we cover all this in my seminar. And the Red Shift, nobody's quite sure what's causing that. Uh, there's numerous the hydrogen lines that appear toward the red spectrum, it is assumed to be some kind of great distance. And the greater the distance, well, here's a textbook from uh, Berkeley University I just got yesterday. Uh, they're saying if the star is nearby, it'll have uh, hydrogen lines that are shifted toward the blue. And if they're, uh, oh, is that gonna show? Look at that. Application window, star distance, redshift, share it. Oh, okay. Uh, so. The theory is that uh, the red shift is caused by what's called the Doppler effect, uh, whether it affects light or not is probably it does. If a train is coming toward you, we know with sound it's easy to explain. If a train is coming toward you, the uh, sound waves are compressed and it raises the pitch. If the train is leaving you, it's refracted or stretched out and it lowers the pitch. So you hear the train come when it goes past you. This is a well-known phenomenon and it's assumed that light is doing the same thing and all the textbooks have examples of that, the Doppler effect of light. If the star is moving toward you, it gives a blue shift. If it's moving away from you, it gives a red shift. This is typical textbook 101. Uh, <clears throat> the correlation was first observed by Edwin Hubble, come to be known as Hubble's Law. Vestio Schliffer was the first to discover galactic red shifts in about 1912. So for about 100 years, this has been observed. And I point out that if we see 
stars giving a red shift and it would appear that they are all leaving us or moving away. I think that's probably reasonable. This textbook from 20 years ago said it was 18 billion years old and now they're saying 13.8 I believe is the number you used. It'll change next week to something else. And <clears throat> this textbook teaches that the Big Bang happens every 80 to 100 billion years. There's a Big Bang and then a Big Squish and then a Big Bang and a Big Squish. It all comes back together again. The oscillating yo-yo universe. Uh, Discover Magazine says everything came from nothing. This is all part of my seminar slides, which you can watch on video number one. Even uh, Alan Guth in Scientific American. The observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. Now, King Krakata, uh, Your Highness, uh, all of the heat that is currently spread out throughout the universe, all of the, the, the temperature, the t total temperature of the sun, the total temperature of all these planets, had to all be in this initial dot. Do you have any idea how hot that would have to be since you're not going to gain heat from anywhere? Where did this, where did this heat come from? There's an enormous amount of heat in the universe. Just add up all the stars and you'll see. Anyway, I talk about the, uh, so I gave my illustration the other night about if we see a crowd A moving away from Jones Bakery at 15 miles an hour toward the three o'clock position and they're 27 miles away, we see crowd B moving away from Jones Bakery at 18 miles an hour toward the 10 o'clock position. And we go through and look at all these different crowds, look at which direction they're traveling, how fast they're going, and how far they are from Jones Bakery. I think we could easily put the crowds together on a chart and say, okay, these guys are only moving three miles an hour. This lady's highly motivated. She's going 25 miles an hour. Uh, so if we put all this data together, and I think we can do that with the stars, and say, okay, the stars appear to be moving away from us. What's the conclusion? Well, we would conclude that there was an explosion at a central point between Dallas and Fort Worth, and that the, our high-speed computer could analyze all this and say the speed of the various crowds indicates uh, one factor we can throw in, and the distance from the bakery and the direction of travel. We only observed each group run for about 10 seconds, enough to run a few feet, which is the equivalent of watching the stars give a red shift for 100 years. Uh, but we know they ran the same speed and the same direction from the very start. So it's completely sci it's our scientific and logical conclusion that an explosion took place in Oven 3 at Jones Bakery 2.43663 billion years ago. Prior to that, all the people we saw running in the various crowds were compressed into a tiny speck of matter much smaller than a period on a page. It was in a jelly donut in Oven number 3. This is what it looked like three nanoseconds before the Big Bang. The entire mass of humanity was in this speck just under the sugar right here. And you can see the red shift right there as this oozing out of the donut. So preliminary research indicates the speck contained the mass of humanity and was accidentally disturbed by an ant, causing it to explode. So obviously Big Bangs leave little hard evidence, so continued research will be slow and costly, and we requested $400 billion to continue this study. This, King Crocoduck and the rest of you evolutionists, is how stupid the evolution and Big Bang theory is. To the average thinking person, this is dumb to see stars giving a red shift and then conclude that that is somehow proof they all started from a single dot smaller than a period on a page. Uh, there are many, many scientists who disagree that red shifts prove uh, the distance or the speed. And there's plenty of articles here, Sky and Telescope Magazine, clear back in 94, they said the red shift is not reliable. Uh, from uh, Sky and Telescope Magazine, a catalog of quasars article. In fact, there's little correlation of brightness to redshift at all. Either quasars come in an extremely wide range of luminosities, as most people believe, or their redshifts do not indicate distance. The only conclusion can be drawn is that, at least for some quasars, are relatively nearby, and a large fraction of their redshift is due to something other than expansion of the universe. Uh, the book, uh, the Evolution Handbook, is nearly a thousand pages with all kinds of uh, documentation about the the silliness of, of believing that this red shift proves anything. So we could talk for hours and hours on this if you'd like. I'll end up producing a whole uh, uh, hour-long DVD on the topic with all the science, quotes from science magazines, uh, research journals, which you like, uh, that show that uh, there could be distant quasars within a nearby galaxy because of the University of California, San Diego. Uh, so. I think that uh, your premise is that because we see a red shift in stars, therefore that means they're moving away. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two, they've always been moving the same speed. Assumption number three, we can measure their distance to these stars. I don't think that's possible at all, and neither do many folks who study this. 
You certainly can't do it with parallax trigonometry beyond about 100 light years. So, and we can talk about that if you'd like. So I have to completely disagree. I don't think the Big Bang is the best model. I think it's dumb. And if you want to believe that, that's fine. Uh, but uh, that, that's, I think for, you need to realize, and you probably do realize, that your, your position is clearly calling Jesus Christ a liar, which, again, you're welcome to do. But uh, Jesus believed that uh, the creation was the beginning. He's the one who did it and told us that, uh, that he did it in six literal days. And I don't see any other way it'll work biologically with all the symbiotic relationships, but that's for another debate. Okay, let's see. So you're claiming the redshift and cosmic background radiation is proof that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. I completely disagree. You've chosen to interpret the evidence that way, but that is not proof of anything. Go ahead. All right. Well, before I begin my somewhat lengthy reply, I just want to let everybody know you can gish, but you can't gallop. I'm going to start with your 94 article, your 1994 article. I happen to be familiar with it, and I happen to be familiar with the controversy surrounding it. Now, this actually relates to uh, quasars and uh, their intrinsic brightness. And it was unclear for a certain amount of time as to what caused this intrinsic brightness. Um, you mentioned that the distances to distant objects cannot be measured using parallax. Kent, I'm very concerned because this will now be the third time that I tell you this, maybe even the fourth time. Uh, I, I said, and possibly even the fifth, uh, there are, I think, in every single conversation or exchange we've had, I've, I've mentioned that we can measure the distance to distant objects using standard candles. Um, you've never contested this. You've never ar um, argued anything to the contrary, but you still keep bringing this up. We don't need to use parallax. We can uh, use type 1a supernovae in order to see the distances to objects uh, millions, even billions of light years away. Uh, and I demonstrated how to do this in my second video reply to you, which, you know, one of these days we get around to watching and hopefully, you know, it'll it'll go in one year and it's not going to go out the other. Um, but the 1994 article, um, it was saying that the absolute brightness was not corresponding to the redshift and that the there was something wrong with the standard candle. So we can either say that there's something wrong with the standard candle or there's something wrong with the redshift. And they, this particular art, article that you're citing opted to go with Redshift. These people who uh, who you cited, they were uh, Fred Hoyle's associates, so they were against the Big Bang. I mentioned Hoyle was the atheist who was against the Big Bang his entire career. Uh, now, uh, what they got wrong was they did not take into account the fact that you cannot use uh, the brightness in these quasars as standard candles. You can't use it in this particular instance. This only applies to very specific situations, things like Cepheid variables, things like type 1a supernovae. Um, that does not apply uh, to quasars. When we're talking about the absolute brightness due to quasars, we're talking about uh, what, what, what's we're talking about a completely different phenomena uh, to what's generally being used to measure distances in other instances. And uh, there are a whole host of peer-reviewed papers that are demonstrating this. The paper you cited is something like 20 years out of date, along with everything else you're citing. And I'll, I'll get to those momentarily. Um, the takeaway is that you have accretion disks at quasars, and that these are creating uh, extremely high energy jets. And at the time that the article was published, um, this was not entirely clear. But it, it has since become clear, so you, you really need to update your research. Um, while we're on the topic of updating your research, you said uh, that the, there are changes in the Big Bang Theory's age, and you cited something from 20 years ago saying it was something like 20 billion years old. We discussed this in the first debate, though, Kent, and you didn't contest it then either. I told you that there are error bars, um, that these are plus or minuses, and that as our instrumentation improves over time, uh, as our ability to measure the necessary variables improves, our capacity to determine the age gets better and better, the error bars become smaller and smaller. So if you look at the error bars for 20 years ago, you're, you're almost certainly going to see that they encompassed the age that we're using right now, and that the age we're using right now has even smaller error bars. So, you know, you, you, it's like every time we talk, every time we correspond, it goes in one year, out the other. Um, I, I'm beginning to wonder if this is a waste of time. Now, you also mentioned the Big Bang and the Big Squish. Again, this is 20, 30 years out of date. Um, nobody subscribes to this model anymore because now that we've made more accurate measurements with WMAP, I'll get to that shortly, um, we know that the universe's expansion is actually accelerating. Uh, the universe is not going to uh, is, is not going to crush into itself. The, the, the evidence is not pointing in that direction. Um, 
initially people thought that it would um, as a result of, 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 of gravity, but we know now that the universe is accelerating in its expansion, so this is, this is not actually what's going to end up happening. Uh, let's see, what else? Right, I just want to address really quickly, you mentioned uh, how computers came to be versus how the universe came to be. Uh, this is a false equivalence. As I said, the Big Bang Theory does not describe how the universe came to be. This is literally the first thing that I mentioned in this debate, and again, in one ear, out the other. Um, so, you know, if, if, we're talk if we really want a good comparison, it's how computers work, function over time, versus how the universe works and how it has functioned over time. Uh, so, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, when it comes to redshifts, uh, there is no controversy as to what redshifts indicate. They absolutely do indicate that things are receding. Um, so, you know, you, you, you have to do your research more carefully. The, if, if you can find me an expert um, today who, who disagrees with that assessment, then by all means pull them up. But um, as, as, as far as anybody can tell, it's, it's simply not the case. All right, so I think that about covers all the important things. Um, my name, King Crocoduck. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time, but just search Kirk Cameron Crocoduck on Google, and uh, it should be should be reasonably clear. Right, so I'm going to show you a little thing. Let me share my screen right now. Right. Okay, so... The cosmic microwave background radiation. You said a few things just now, Kent. You said that the cosmic microwave background radiation and the redshift of the galaxies, uh, this, these are things that we're interpreting, that we're looking at the evidence and we're interpreting it in order to make it conform with the Big Bang model. Um, but this is projection. This is what creationists do. As I mentioned in the first debate, this is what lawyers get paid to do. It's not what scientists do. So. Uh, let's. This is the part that I want you to pay the closest attention to because this is the most. This is the most important thing. With your jelly donut thing, um, let me think. With, with your jelly donut thing, um, you raise an interesting question, and it's a question that Gamow was thinking about in the 1930s. Question is, how do we know that the universe expanded from a hot, dense state billions of years ago? What if it only started expanding a hundred years ago, before Hubble actually saw these things? Uh, and the answer is the cosmic microwave background radiation. As I said, we, we examine a theory's uh, power in terms of its predictive capabilities, in terms of its ability to predict novel uh, phenomena. And the cosmic microwave background radiation is by far the best example of this. So here are these three guys. We have Gamow, Alpher, and Herman, three physicists in the 1940s. And Gamow's realization was that the early universe must have been hot. Uh, as you indicated, Mr. Hope, the universe was incredibly hot. So hot that it was basically all just a huge ionized plasma. Uh, everything was extremely dense, high collision rates and high friction made the temperature super high. Everything was just plasma and radiation. Um, but as the universe expands under the Big Bang model, Gamow realized, okay, it, if, if the Big Bang Theory is correct, then this plasma must have cooled over time. And if it did cool over time, um, it, must have, it must have cooled sufficiently to allow electrons uh, to form stable bonds with protons. If the energy is too high, then these bonds are not able to form. Uh, you're not able to have neutral hydrogen atoms. Now here I have a little diagram of emission and absorption. My video is Quantum Theory Made Easy, Parts 1 and 2 describe this process in a little bit more detail. Um, but the upshot is that you essentially have a giant ball of plasma of the size of the universe and that it's trapping all the light and the light is bouncing from, uh, from atom to atom. It's getting emitted and absorbed extremely quickly. Uh, it's just, it's just being bounced around. It's super dense and it's, it's not able to travel freely. But as the universe is expanding and as the universe is cooling, um, you are able to have the formation of stable, um, hydrogen nuclei and this uh, this 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 is this um, this process is called recombination. This this part of the Big Bang theory is called recombination. So if you turn back to the little diagram I showed earlier, you'll see at 380,000 years after the Big Bang, they calculate this is approximately the time under the model uh, based on the rate of expansion um, that you should you should be seeing this recombination. Now, once the uh, once the universe becomes sufficiently cool, it becomes increasingly difficult for the photons to excite um, these 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 ionized particles. Um, so they cease to be absorbed and emitted, 
and eventually they end up scattering off in every direction. So here we have at low enough temperatures, the photons become insufficiently energetic to excite the atoms, and instead they scatter away. And this is called decoupling. Uh, and you can see here the photon on the left, the little squiggly thing, is hitting the electron, and a less energetic version of it is bouncing away while the electron is bouncing away. So once the universe becomes sufficiently cool, Gamma realizes under this model, there should be light streaming in every direction carrying this information uh, of this super hot plasma. And it should be going everywhere in every direction in the universe. Uh, and it, it, it should exhibit what's called isotropy. It should, uh, th th there are a number of predictions associated with this, and I'll get to those in turn. Um, but anyway, the point is, uh, if it is the case that the universe did, uh, it, it, you know, if, if we are allowed to extrapolate, if we are to say that these redshifts can be extrapolated all the way back to the super hot and dense plasma state, then we have to posit that, that there is some trace of this super hot plasma, and that plasma is what is called the cosmic background radiation. So what kind of predictions were associated with it? Well, Gamma showed that these scattered photons should still be reaching us. They should be highly redshifted, and they should match a black body spectrum. Plasma, the, the plasma uh, state of the universe was a perfect absorber. Uh, a black body is basically, that's basically the definition of a black body. Uh, it's, it's a perfect absorber. It, it, it does not reflect light. Um, and it has a very specific curve associated with it. I have all these curves here, so I just want to draw your attention really quickly. This bottom curve we have... Uh, it, it confirms to a certain function, but um, the y-axis is the intensity and the x-axis is the wavelength. Uh, the intensity is, is the intensity of that particular wavelength. Uh, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum has all these wavelengths, you know, x-ray, microwave, visible, and so on. So at the peak of this one, we have that the wave, uh, this one is 3,000 Kelvin. Its peak is at this wavelength, this uh, other black body curve right here. It's 4,000 Kelvin. Its peak is at this wavelength. We have another black body curve right here. Its peak is right here. Um, we have this black body curve, 6,000 Kelvin. That's approximately the temperature of the sun. And its peak wavelength is right here. What these peak wavelengths basically mean is that this is uh, this this is where th this is th this is the most of the wavelengths. Well, th that's that's not entirely correct. This is a well, it's the peak. The, of, if, you, if you look at the distribution, this is, this is the highest point of the distribution. Um, you know, if, if you're sorting it according to which wavelengths are, you know, how many of this kind of wavelength, how many of this kind of wavelength, how many of this kind of wavelength, the peak says uh, this kind of wavelength has the most being emitted from the source at this temperature. There is this equation right here associated with that. Very easy algebraic equation. Um, you know, it should be very basic. Even a creationist can understand. And uh, the temperature is 2.9 times 10 to the negative 3 divided by the uh, peak wavelength at that temperature. So uh, keep this equation in mind. It's going to be important. Now, Alpha and Herman, they were the research associates of Gamma. They predicted the temperature of the background radiation based on the expansion rate of the universe. They said that if this background radiation does exist, it has to have a certain temperature. Now, pay attention to the date here. This was April of 1950. And it says here, from, from equation 91C, one can then calculate rho sub r double prime, the present density of radiation, the residual radiation density from the expansion alone, as rho sub r double prime equals this thing. The value of rho sub r double prime corresponds to a temperature now of about 5 degrees Kelvin. So what they're basically saying is that the cosmic mi microwave background radiation should be approximately 5 Kelvin. Uh, then in 1963, Penzias and Wilson discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation. And in 1989, the COBE satellite, the Cosmic Background Explorer, was launched, made precise measurements of the spectrum. And I want you to pay close attention here. We have this green line showing what a black body spectrum would look like, and the red error bars here showing the COBE data. It is a perfect fit. What you're looking at is the best measurement ever taken of a black body spectrum. Um, so this prediction was knocked out of the park. Uh, they predicted the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation. They predicted what shape it should have. And if you look at where the peak is, this is in terms of frequency instead of wavelength. But if you convert to wavelength and then plug into this equation, you can get the temperature. The temperature, turned out, was approximately 2.74 Kelvin at the peak. Uh, they predicted 5 Kelvin, which is pretty damn good, given the, the instruments that they had available to them. Um, you know, at, 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 under any event, this falls well within the error bars. 
Uh, and as you can see from the images that we got ever since, here's Kobe from 1992, WMAP, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe from 2003, and the ESA Planck satellite from 2013. Um, you, you can see that they all, well, it's a little bit more difficult with Kobe, but you, you can see from these two at least that there is uh, certainly isotropy. Um, and the anisotropies are about one part in 100,000. You, you need that in order to have large scale structure. Uh, so to summarize, the Big Bang Theory accurately predicted the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the shape of its spectrum, its temperature, its peak wavelength, its general isotropy. <coughs> all of these were predicted decades in advance. So my question to you, Mr. Hovind, and to all creationists, is why? This is not something that was interpreted ad hoc. This is not like, oh, look, it's dogs produce dogs, therefore my thing is correct. No, no, no. This was, this was predicted beforehand, and it was predicted with stupendous accuracy. Um, and this thing was predicted directly as a consequence of the universe expanding from a hot, dense state. All of the calculations associated with this uh, took into consideration the model saying that the universe was once this plasma, that, that there was once this physics going on. Um, so I will leave it to you, Mr. Hovind, to try to address this. If, if you don't have time to address everything that I addressed in turn, that's fine. Um, but address this at least. So I will leave it to you now. Okay, well, thank you, sir. To share screen, what do I do? Live, share screen. Okay. Praise God for Steve here. Okay. Somebody's breathing into their microphone pretty heavy. <clears throat> Way before any of these guys you mentioned, the book of Isaiah written about 600 years before Christ, I think that's way before all those guys you mentioned, said that God stretched out the heavens. <clears throat> Isaiah 42, Isaiah 45, he stretched out the heavens. There are 17 references in the Bible where it says God stretched out the heavens. So if indeed the moving of the stars or the stretching of the heavens could be predicted uh, and to cause some of the effects that you mentioned, I think it was predicted 2,600 years ago, right in God's word. So I don't think... Uh, that it's any evidence at all for a big bang it could just as much be evidence that god's word is exactly correct you said we cannot use brightness for quasars because they have accretion disks that are uh, the high energy disk i'm still baffled i guess and i'd like you to address the question was all of the temperature that is currently distributed throughout the universe and i'm, I'm confused uh, because nearly all the big bang models talk about in one very tiny dot and yet you say it was the size of the universe. Uh, you said, I think I got your quote here, uh, the plasma was the size of our universe. I have to go back and listen to the tape. But So which was it? Was it all in one dot, or was it uh, uh, the size of the current universe? And uh, you know, what is the size of the current universe? I know we have a visible spot, but is that is that the end of it? So. Uh, to say that you can't use brightness with quasars, but you can, how do then do you know you can use it with other things? And you said the expansion is accelerating. Uh, you said that in several several times we've taught. Where is this energy coming from? All known physics tells us it to make anything move requires energy. Where is the energy coming from to move anything, let alone to? If something, if the universe is accelerating in its expansion, I guess I'm still baffled. I think most folks are. Where is this energy coming from? Uh, who's adding this energy, or is it just intrinsic in the matter, it's the stars itself? I don't know about gish galloping. I'd sure like to do this one topic at a time. That's something you've accused several times. I think you're the one that just did it. You just went over 15 topics, and there's no way I can possibly answer all of them. So you're the one that does the gish galloping. You have given absolutely no logical explanation for how you could have all this temperature and all this mass in such a tiny dot. If it was plasma, was this plasma was compressed into a dot smaller than a period on a page? Wouldn't that be like you know, solid matter? Uh, I, I showed in my textbook, all the textbooks teach it was the Big Bang came from a dot smaller than a period on a page. Uh, that is indeed what uh, what I've seen, and, and I collect the textbooks. And so anyway, uh, I think that you're observing the red shift, and you're observing a cosmic background radiation. 
very interesting observations that does not prove a Big Bang. Even if the Big Bang model did predict those things, it could still be explained by God's word with the expansion of the heavens. If God created it all in six days and he's the one who spread it out, you would get exactly the same effect. You would still get the cosmic background radiation and still get the red shift. So I don't think you've, dis you've proven the Big Bang or disproven the Bible in any way, shape, or form. Uh, again, you, you just galloped over and gave me 20 topics. I can't get them all. Uh, so we'll do this one at a time. Uh, let's see. Um, and you, you may have been a slip of the tongue there, but you said, as the universe cooled, light streamed in all directions, carrying the information. Uh, that's another thing I'd love for you to explain. Obviously, there appears to be information in, like in our DNA code and everything, information, not just matter. Uh, the zeros and ones in a computer code is not just zeros and ones. It carries information. Morse code is uh, even writing on a piece of paper. It's not just ink on paper. It carries information. So was the information that is currently spread out, just, just let's just take uh, in, in Lenox, Alabama, with the 35 people that live here, each of them probably has books in their house and libraries. And you, it, the whole world, all this information was in this dot, all of this temperature was in this dot, and all of this matter was in this dot. Is that what I'm hearing you say that you believe? Go ahead. Hello? Okay. Um, okay, so it sounds like there's an argument from incredulity at play here. Uh, how could all of this mass and, and heat be concentrated in a single dot? Um, I, I, I don't see what the physical problem is. You can, in principle, compress an arbitrary amount of energy into an arbitrarily small amount of space. Of course, you're going to end up with a black hole as a result, but, you know, that's, that's kind of how it goes. Now, with regard to what was all of the Big Bang in one dot, uh, and versus the you know was 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 uh, was this plasma state the size of the entire universe? Well, the entire observable universe was at one point inside of this one dot, um, but that doesn't mean that the entire universe, you know, the the universe outside of our observable universe, uh, it, it it does exist. There are things that are leaving our cos our cosmic horizon. Um, that was greater than the size of a dot. Uh, how exactly big the universe is, I don't know. Uh, it could be infinite, it could be finite, it's not clear at this time. Um, let's see. But uh, in, in, in principle, I, I don't see... If you could show me what uh, principle in physics says that uh, there's, there's a limit to density, um, then by all means cite it. I'll, I'll be happy to take it into consideration. Now... With regard to gish galloping, um, Kent, you were the one who brought up all those topics. All I did was address them. Uh, pff, don't get mad at me. Uh, if, if you don't want me to address all of your topics and then bring up my own, don't bring up a zillion topics. Pick one and stick with it. Now, with regard to light carrying information, um, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, in order to see something, light is reflecting off of it and enters our cornea. There's a chemical and physical interaction. Um, this is all that I meant by it. You know, I'm not talking about zeros and one. I'm not talking about a computer programmer. Now, with regard to, let's see, what else were you saying? Ah, okay, so the Bible able to account for cosmic microwave background radiation. Well, this is what I mean by ad hoc rationalization. And I was, uh, I said at the beginning of the first debate, this is, this, at this point, you were admitting that you are a lawyer and not a scientist you are looking at the evidence that we have gathered, the evidence that we have accurately predicted, and you are now writing our coattails in order to prop up this, frankly, infantile model. Um, you know, sorry, we made the predictions. Your model did not. Where does the Bible talk about the cosmic microwave background radiation? Where does it talk about the black body curve? Where does it talk about the temperature? Um, you can't just look at these cryptic verses of God stretched out the heavens. What about the next part where it says that he puts it over the universe like a tent? Uh, w w what is the analog to that in physics? And why is it that nobody was pointing to the Bible and its supposedly accurate prediction uh, prior to the Big Bang? Um, you know, why weren't Christians talking about the Big Bang theory for however long they've been around? Um, as I said, this is all ad hoc rationalization, and every every religious group, every guru, every New Age person does it. It's like, look at what the Bhagavad Gita says. It talks about, 
it, it made this prediction so and so and look at how uh, the Quran teaches us to to teach to 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 uh, to wash our hands and all of all of this other stuff and people are uh, you know I you could you could pull up a whole list it's it's very easy to find um, just go to any apologetics website for literally any religion and you're going to see them make the same claims everybody tries to make uh, science into their own everybody tries to pimp their personal ideologies using uh, the hard earned predictions of science using the hard earned successes of science. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, when it comes to one's metaphysical beliefs about whether a creator exists or not, that's not really, I, I don't particularly care. Uh, what I do care about is whether people are claiming, uh, what should we call it, whether people are claiming that the universe was made over the course of 6,000 years in a single six-day creation event, or whether uh, it was made over the course of 13.8 billion years, um, as, as the science shows. Now... When it comes to the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, th there's, uh, I'm afraid this is simply not compatible with the Bible. We are talking about an extremely hot and dense plasma state, and we are talking about a calculation that all these calculations that were made um, using this model, using 13.8 billion years, not 6,000 years. Um, if you can show me the creationist calculations to show me how they can possibly come out with the same results using their what, what are going to be mutually contradictory calculations, um, you know, it's mathematically impossible. So, let's see. Is there anything else? Ah, okay. You mentioned uh, at, the, at the beginning quasars and brightness. So, how do we know that we can use brightness as a distance calculator if we can't use them with quasars? Because standard candles are not a one-size-fit-all solution. Um, quasars are not a standard candle. Standard candles are include type 1a supernovae and Cepheid variables. Uh, these are completely different physical processes that are taking place, and we we can use them um, because we've we've been able to demonstrate that they are cross confirmed by things like redshift, uh, by other distance by other distance measurements, uh, parallax as well, and with each other, um, they cross confirm one another independently. Um, in fact, the reason we know that quasars cannot be used as a standard candle is because they're not cross confirmed. This is an example of how science can engage in self-correction and show us what the parameters are of our methods. Uh, and finally, where is the energy coming from to drive the Big Bang? Uh, well, we discussed this in the first debate. Dark energy is the name that we give it. Um, what it is, I can't tell you. We don't know yet. What we do know is the universe is accelerating, and as you accurately pointed out, something must be causing this acceleration. Um, so, I mean, I don't really see what we're arguing about. We agree the universe is accelerating. We agree something is causing it. You can call it whatever you want. We're calling it dark energy. So, I mean, deal with it, I guess. Uh, one more thing. I don't think you addressed my point, the point that I really want you to address. If the Big Bang Theory is not an accurate model, if, it, if it's not our best model, then why was it able to so accurately predict all of these different aspects of the cosmic microwave background radiation? Um, these ad hoc rationalizations are just an excuse. So I, you know, you're going to have to do better than that. So, your turn. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you keep saying, we made this prediction, we did this, we did that. You're a, you're a, you have a bachelor's degree. You're, what, 24 years old. You're working on uh, your master's degree, and you are now taking credit for all of it. You're part of the we, I guess. Uh, I don't understand how you got into the we at your age already, but since the stuff was done in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So we make predictions, we do that. Okay, so the red shift has been observed since, since 1912, as I pointed out, for about 100 years. Um, and everybody tries to make science their own, was sort of the quote you had. Every, I understand every group tries to say, like, like you said, the Muslims, look, we wash our hands and how this kills germs, and they didn't even know about germs when the Quran was written. Right. Uh, you're doing the same thing. You're trying to include, okay, you're saying, see, we have, we have accomplished this, we have done this. The expansion of the universe, I don't know that we know that it is accelerating in its expansion. I don't know that anybody could prove such a thing. That may be a current theory. So you asked me several times the question, I guess. Again, you gish gallop, but I didn't get time to answer them all. If the Big Bang Theory is not the best answer, why were they able to predict all these things? Well, any court of law, if you, you're the, being the lawyer here, <clears throat> not me, in any court of law, they look at evidence and can be interpreted several different ways. And you are choosing to interpret the evidence in light of, to, to, in favor of your theory. Uh, 
there is, you mentioned the standard candles. Someone sent me an article. They said uh, he's going to bring this up. He always does. Uh, an article, let's see, from cosmosmagazine.com. Standard, supernova standard candles, not so standard after all. And it goes through all the, uh, you know, the, 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 the variations within what's so-called standard candles. So to, to say that the brightness of something can tell you the distance without knowing all the other possible factors that could influence that, I think is, is a little stretch. There's a large article on this topic on uh, Walt Brown's website. I don't know if you've ever debated Walt Brown, uh, PhD in physics, taught at the Air Force Academy, taught physics for years at the Air Force Academy in Colorado. CreationScience.com is his website where he has a large article on that topic if you care to read it and try to refute it. So I, I, I think what I heard you say or imply was yes, all this, this dot that you envision did contain all of the temperature and all of the mass. The total temperature of all of the stars, the total temperature, the total mass of all of the universe was in this dot. And you don't see a problem. You don't see a limit to how matter. I think there's a common sense. I don't think you can squeeze a Volkswagen into a dot the size of a period on a page with every all the pressure in the world. And again, you're back to the question, where's this energy coming from to do the squishing? To say gravity is to, is, is to avoid the answer, or to avoid the question, because where did this gravity come from? Um, I'm glad you said you don't know uh, that about dark matter. Nobody does. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's the ghost in the closet causing these things to happen for you. Oh, yeah, dark matter is causing it. You don't know what it is yet, but we do think that's probably it. Um, <clears throat> I think what you have uh, is a religion. You believe these things. I don't think you'll ever admit it, or you probably won't even ever actually see it. But, yes, you have a religious worldview. You believe these things by faith. You believe there's no limit to how much matter can be compressed. You believe this dot contained all the temperature and all the mass, and you believe the expansion of the universe is A, is happening, and B, is being driven by something you have no clue what it is, <clears throat> nor does anybody. So I wish you guys who believe in evolution would just simply admit it's a religion, and we could all get along fine. But you don't. You want it to be considered science, and you want everybody to be forced to pay for it. And as I've said many, many times, that's one of my gripes. And you ought to keep your religion at home or teach it in your own private school, but not in the public schools. Okay. Again, you gish galloped all over, so I'm trying to cover Let's just narrow it down to one topic. Which one do you want? I'd like you to answer one topic. Do you, yes or no, believe all this dot or this cosmic uh, or this plasma contained all of the temperature, of the cumulative temperature of all of the stars that are burning, uh, in in this one in this one cosmic in this one little tiny dot, this how hot was that dot? Have you calculated the total temperature of all of the stars? The seventy sextillion of them was the last estimate I heard. What is the total cumulative temperature? How many degrees Kelvin or Celsius or Fahrenheit is that? What is your guess on that? And where did this temperature? Where did this heat come from? Go ahead. Okay, so with regard to um, not being able to answer all the challenges you put to me, I'm sorry, uh, that's that's not acceptable to me. If you want to address only one of the points that I'm going to respond to, you can do that, and I'm not going to bring anything else up. Um, but it's not it's not going to it's it, you know basically the, the ball is in, is going to be in your court uh, when it comes to make this decision. Now the reason we teach these things in the science classroom is because these things are not interpreted as you say uh, that I'm doing. You know, I'm not being a lawyer here. We predicted this before it happens, you understand. We predicted the cosmic microwave background radiation's existence and all of these other features of it. Um, it's not like, oh, hey, here's this thing. Let's, let's, make, let's twist it and turn it in order to make it fit our model. No, it was predicted beforehand, and you have no explanation as to why this is the case. And I insist that you give one. Uh, this, is, this is the central point that I'm trying to make. Um, now, I keep using the word we. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm using a colloquialism here. Uh, I'm not 24, by the way. I'm 22. Uh, and no, I, I was obviously not around in the 30s and 40s when, when these predictions were first uh, coming to fruition. But when I say we, I mean we as in we in the scientific enterprise. We who understand and respect science. We as in my predecessors. In my predecessors. 
uh, when it comes to the dot that contains all temperature and matter, um, with all due respect, Mr. Hovind, I don't care about your common sense. Your common sense is utter, utterly meaningless. Intuition is meaningless. This is, this is the first lesson that every physicist has to learn. Um, our intuition when it comes to Newtonian mechanics about how all objects are accelerating the same in a gravitational field, how if you drop an elephant and a laptop off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, their acceleration is going to be identical. This, this defies intuition, and this is basic Newtonian mechanics. Uh, you talk about quantum mechanics, you talk the thing that allows our computers to exist, you know, with transistors and diodes and the such. Um, you know, those things only exist because of p-junctions, and those p-n-junctions can only exist because of something called electron tunneling. Um, this defies intuition. If you, if you look into what electron tunneling is, it's literally an electron hits a barrier that it should not be able to permeate, and then it teleports to the other side and keeps on going. Uh, wh what kind of intuition accounts for this? None. It doesn't matter what our intuition is. What about relativity? What about uh, different, uh, different clocks in different gravitational fields? Uh, what, 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 what kind of intuition is able to account for this? Uh, and yet we know it works. We know, uh, we know it's able to work because, A, it's been able to accurately predict future data for the past 100 years. I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but this is kind of a recurring theme. If it can accurately make novel, uh, accurate predictions of future data, then we take it on board and we teach it in the science classroom. If not, then we throw it out. Um, let me see. Yeah, so so when it comes to you, you know this 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 intuition of how you can't fit a Volkswagen and a dot. I mean, look up neutron stars. Uh, you're going to change your mind pretty quickly. Um, you know, when when we're talking about the Big Bang, we're talking about the smallest and highest energy system conceivable. All right, we're we're talking about the realm of quantum field theory and 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 at the boundaries of that field. Um, the the amount of math is crazy. It's it's you know I I'm no mathematician. I'm but a humble physicist. Um, but I think that the math done by the people who are at these this part of the field is beyond even most mathematicians. Uh, this this stuff is simply beyond intuition. If you if anybody wants to speak intelligibly on these topics beyond this bare bone high school basic level that I'm trying to talk to you about it here, one has to go to these to these elite schools and and go to these elite graduate programs and basically spend their years with their butts in the chair and reading and reading and doing all this crazy math in order to even be able to scratch the surface, to be able to even begin to discuss such a complicated system. Um, so when it comes to intuition and how you disagree with a the theory because you it, it contradicts your common sense, with all due respect, Mr. Hovind, I don't ever want to hear that argument again. The, the physics, the physicists have, have learned this lesson for the past 150 years, and it is it has been a very bitter pill to swallow. Um, and if you're going to attack our models, um, you might as well swallow the pill as well. Now, when it comes to your Source and Cosmos magazine, I mentioned last time you really shouldn't be using um, these kinds of sources. If, if you really have an objection, a serious objection, you need to go to the original peer-reviewed source and you need to show me um, what the objection is. First, first of all, you have to read it. Um, it's not enough to just cite it, you know, read a creationist book and say, oh, hey, they cited this. I'm going to put this on my slides. That's, that's, not, that's not okay. You have to read the actual thing and you have to understand the argument. Um, when it comes to brightness, uh, yes, it can be used. As I mentioned, it's cross-confirmed by things like redshift uh, when, when we compare it to the distances we get from redshift and Hubble's law and when we compare it to uh, Cepheid variables. Uh, so these these things are independently cross confirmed. Uh, this is this is how we're able to to verify these sort of things. Now, finally, um, when it comes to dark matter and dark energy, uh, yeah, these are not the same things, Kent. You you made the same confusion in our first debate. Dark matter has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about. What you're trying to describe is dark energy. Um, when it comes to the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, this this is also overwhelmingly demonstrated. Um, you know, you you haven't been keeping up with the science of the past twenty years, uh, but if you look at the, for instance, the winners of the twenty eleven Nobel Prize, uh, the people who who got the prize that year, it was because of their discovery that the universe is expansion is accelerating. Um, you know, you 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 don't have a leg to stand on if you want to argue against this point. The the evidence for it is overwhelming. I can't go over all of it right now because I don't have slides available for it. 
Um, but basically, it has to do with supernovae. And I will give you a link if you want to look into it further. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is, I, I, I even believe that you, in the first debate, uh, said you agreed that the universe is accelerating. Uh, so I'm not sure what changed your mind in the time in between. So, yeah, if, if from this point forward you want to focus on just one topic, um, then by all means, you can respond to only one thing. But, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, well, just to narrow this down here a little bit, you said, I believe I, I can't write fast enough here, uh, different clocks uh, go at different speeds in different gravitational fields. Uh, is that Explain what you mean by that. I think I agree with you, but explain what that means. So when it comes to clocks in different gravitational fields, what this means is that when you have different, uh, let's say, for instance, I'm on Earth and we have a satellite up in orbit, um, the clocks are going to be running at different speeds because space-time is being, uh, the, 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 the space-time is different at these two different fields. This is one of the predictions of general relativity. So this is what I mean by clocks run slower. Correct. Okay, so does increased gravity speed the clock up or slow it down? It slows down time from uh, a certain observers. It depends on where you are. So if your initial, you're breathing in the mic again, if, you're, uh, <clears throat> if your initial dot contained all the matter in the universe, wouldn't the gravity be pretty intense? Would that affect the uh, clocks at all? Yes, it would. So could this 13.8 uh, or 14.9 or 20.6 or whatever number they're using, uh, could that be inaccurate based on that alone? Um, no. Uh, there are a couple reasons for it uh, with regard to the locations of the observers, as I mentioned. But the most important one is that the expansion happens so quickly uh, that the mass density uh, effectively canceled out this kind of extreme singularity uh, very quickly. I mean, the, when, when, when we're talking about you know the very first moments um, you know, in, in this Planck time, this 10 to the minus 43 seconds, um, this this curvature is achieving near flatness uh, at a ridiculously fast pace. So, I mean, um, but in any event, if, if it was the case that this did have an effect on the time, I don't think it would play in your favor because in a stronger gravitational field, time is moving more slowly, in which case well, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, the universe would actually... Yeah, I'm not trying to get it yeah. in my favor or not. I'm trying for you to understand uh, that if indeed gravity also affects time, it may be something to consider. Okay. Uh, Dark energy, you've brought that up a half a dozen times. Uh, has this ever been, is it, uh, where did it come from? What is it? And what is the hard scientific evidence for it, for the very, even the existence of dark energy? Explain to the listening audience, what on earth is this? And is this theoretical or is this actual? Dark energy is the name that we give to whatever is causing the acceleration of the universe which is a non-answer. You don't know. Uh, you're assuming it is something is causing it, therefore. So what, I don't, think I, so I what, don't it, think I agree. It, hold on, hold on. Uh, there's, there's an uncaused cause is what you're saying? Well, you don't know what dark energy is. There are a lot of things so, I don't know, Kent. I don't know what you had for breakfast this morning. I don't know who your mother is, but I presume you had one. I don't know how gravity works at the quantum level. I mean, what's your point? Are you trying to pin me down on something I don't know? Because I'll give you a whole list right now. Well, no, I'm pointing out that you're relying pretty heavily on something that is not really part of science. It's, I'm uh, not relying on it at all. The Big Bang Theory stands independently of dark energy. Um, dark energy is only used to explain the acceleration of the expansion that we're witnessing right now. Well, and I don't think I agreed ever in any debate that, that the expansion of the universe is actually, that, that the acceleration of the expansion is actually happening. Uh, I think that may be true. I don't think it's been proven. In your mind, it's already done. It's been proven. The, so the universe is not only expanding, the rate of expansion is increasing. The Nobel uh, Committee would seem to agree with me. Yeah, they gave Al Gore a Nobel Prize, too. I'm not sure I'm too impressed with them. Not uh, for science. <laughs> that's for sure. Or for common sense. Uh, well, let's see. Um, well, whatever. I'm not going to even get into that. But go okay. Ahead. Uh, so you... Uh, the universe, based based on the red shift and these standard candles, which may or may not be standard, 
uh, you are assuming the universe is expanding, and I think it is. I think I gave a biblical explanation that came 2,600 years before anything you came up with or any of your friends came up with, that God said he stretched out the heavens, and I don't see how the anything we've observed, the fact that some six, 600 years before Christ, uh, observer reading Isaiah, <clears throat> did not come up with the question about redshift, is, is obvious. Hello? They didn't come up with a lot of questions for a long time, but it doesn't make it not true. It doesn't make your Big Bang Theory true. I think that <clears throat> if we just went back and looked at those 17 verses dealing with the stretching of the heavens, we could come up with the same theories and, and interpret the same evidence and, in this, in, and make it match that exactly. And then when you say, you know, when we see the scores of verses where God said he created everything in six days, uh, that, I don't see any way other than that for it to work with all the uh, symbiotic relationships, which is a different field of biology, but there's just... and. These laws like gravity, centrifugal force, all these laws that govern our universe seem to be... But Ken, you're being a lawyer, not a scientist. <clears throat> what you're trying to do right now, you're the one who is trying to, uh, who's trying to force science into this, this Bible, this literal why young earth creationist Bible-shaped box. Um, that is not what the scientists have done. They have made predictions about future data. Lamatrier used Einstein's uh, general relativity field equation. Uh, so did Alexander Friedman, by the way. We, we talked about him in a previous debate. Um, and this prediction was verified by Hubble. Um, you know, the, 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 the trouble is uh, you, you take these sort of cryptic verses. I mean, you, you at the very least, explain the tent part to me. When it says in Isaiah that he stretched the universe and, and, and put it like a tent, what, what, what does this tent mean? Am I on here? And most importantly, the most important thing, the, the, as, I, as I mentioned, the central point, how do you get the cosmic microwave background radiation in a young Earth creationist universe? <clears throat> it's mathematically impossible. I'm, I'm convinced of this. Uh, I'm uh, Kent, you're I'm muted. Right yeah, there we go. Okay. There. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you are. You're convinced of a lot of things that may or may not be true. Okay, you, you asked about the tent. Let's take one topic at a time. I don't know uh, what the Isaiah verse means about God putting it in a tent. I know there are numerous verses, and uh, you're breathing in the mic again. Uh, somebody is. Okay. Uh, I think the uh, uh, Genesis 1 clearly teaches there was water above the firmament, and the firmament's clearly where the birds fly, according to verse 20. Second Peter chapter 3 says the earth was created in the water and out of the water, and I cover for 30 minutes on my DVD number 2, about what's called the canopy theory. There used to be a crystalline canopy a few inches thick, 10 or 15, 10 or 15 miles up. That explains the great longevity and the giant reptiles that are found fossilized. We call them dinosaurs today. Probably used to be called dragons. But certainly giant animals have lived on the earth, giant sloth 18 feet tall. Something was different on the planet. Uh, at some time in its history, we have fossils of centipedes eight feet long and fossils of uh, grasshoppers two feet long. I think the fossil record is replete with giantism of just about every species, and this requires a greater air pressure and uh, less radiation probably from the sun. So the Christian theory, and it is a theory, is that there was a canopy, a tent or something above the whole world, the like, giant greenhouse. I would pick a number wildly and say 10 miles up, there were two or three inches thick layer of super cold ice called the canopy theory, and I cover that. But again, I'm not asking for the taxpayers to pay for my view to be taught. We do this at our own expense. But I think what is beyond, Psalm 148 says, waters that be, present tense, that be above the heavens. What is beyond the last star? Nobody knows. Maybe it all is in some kind of canopy or some kind of tent. So to say that we don't understand the Isaiah verse, therefore it's not true, we don't know where, the, where it all ends. Maybe everything we observe in this universe is sitting in a glass ball, a snow globe on God's dresser. Uh, you don't know that. I don't know that. We can't prove such a thing. So I think from our little, it's like Horton, here's the who, the story, you know, we're all whoville, all on this little tiny speck floating around in space. Maybe we're just not as big as, and bad as we think we are, and maybe we're not much in the sight of the creator, the God of the universe. So here God is telling us that he wrote a book. God is telling us that he preserved this book, and God is telling us that he came down to earth in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, and that uh, you are, I think, directly or indirectly, are calling all of that a lie, which you're welcome to do. But uh, I think you're in a dangerous position. Again, Occam's, or, uh, 
Pascal's wager. This is not going to affect me at all judgment day if I'm wrong. If you're right, I haven't lost a thing. I've had a wonderful life. It's amazing. And if you're wrong, you're in real serious trouble. So, okay, but that's another story. So I, if, uh, to answer the question about the tent, I would have to say, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows, but God did say it. So maybe it takes a while for science to catch up with God's word. It certainly has all through history. Kent, I'm sorry, but this is just a cryptic interpretation. You know, you can interpret literally anything. As I mentioned, the Muslims do it with the Quran. Uh, other people do it with the Bhagavad Gita. Everybody takes science, as I said, and uses it to pimp their own worldview. Um, with regard to the canopy theory, I can't get into much detail right now, but I can tell you that the friction of the uh, caused by the variations in barometric pressures across different parts of the atmosphere uh, would have caused it to collapse very quickly. Um, what your what your canopy theory is proposing is simply not physically feasible. Um, it's not physically, it's but not I, physically feasible for everything to be in one dot, smaller than a period on a page, either. Why? Why? It's, okay, then what why principle? Is, then why is the canopy theory not feasible? By what principle? Um, by the fact that the variance in barometric pressures would have caused friction that would have resulted in the ice canopy melting. You wouldn't have any. You wouldn't have any differential pressure t t temperatures or pressures. It'd all be one even temperature. One why? even temperature. One even the pressure. Cold, in, inside of a canopy. The atmosphere, can't, can't, the atmosphere is a fluid. Its behavior is chaotic. Uh, this. Come on. This is basics. What if it was compressed? Is the is the atmosphere inside an air compressor chamber uh, chaotic and fluid, or is is just by virtue of the pressure is it more stable? No, 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 no. A, a fluid is the, the atmosphere is a fluid. It's it's comprised of particles that are behaving. In, in, in you know you have things like turbulent flow. You have you have to apply chaos theory to describe the dynamics of these things. There's there's no way you have a uniformity of pressure, uh, even if you try to idealize the situation. I mean, basically, the only way you get that is by having a vacuum. But, you know, then good luck okay. to all the organisms on, on Earth. You need to watch the weather channel once in a while. When there's high pressure, there are no clouds and clear sky. When there's low pressure is when you get the turbulence. Yeah, that's when you get the storms, your, the hurricanes, the temperature. How, how does that contradict what I'm saying? Well, it's exactly opposite to what you're saying. I'm pointing out that if there were a canopy of ice above the atmosphere, squeezing our current, let's say, 60 miles effective uh, atmosphere, Six, squeeze it down to 10 miles and cap it off with a greenhouse uh, cap uh, that could be suspended by the air pressure itself, like a, a giant inflatable dome, or could be suspended by the magnetic field of the Earth, or maybe both. The, whoa, 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 whoa. How is the magnetic field suspending ice? What are you talking about, Kent? At super cold temperatures, outer space is about minus 450, what, three or four. I don't know. It depends on your location, I'm sure. But uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, or you know, two degrees, three degrees Kelvin, uh, or minus 172, whatever it is, uh, 171 uh, centigrade, whatever scale you want to use. I think everybody would agree that outer space is real chilly, close to absolute zero. So I'm it, not disputing that the canopy would have been ice if it had existed. What I'm disputing is that the magnetic field is even remotely capable, even in principle, of holding up this kind of structure you're describing. I mean, what, what kind of physics are you coming up with? As ice gets colder and colder, it changes its uh, crystalline structure. Under pressure, glacial ice turns to fern, F-I-R-N, and it will flow like a plastic. Under extremely low temperatures, ice starts to become laminated. It becomes hydrogen layers, oxygen layers, hydrogen layers, rather than the six-sided crystal of typical ice, that uh, snowflake uh, type crystal, <clears throat> that changes crystalline structure. And be there's a large article on... Uh, Carl Baugh's website about this, uh, I can't think of the name of his website now, creationevidence.org, about the crystalline structure of ice changing at extremely low temperatures. So if there were a crystalline canopy above the earth, and that's what the Jews have always taught, Josephus taught that. He was a Roman, well, he worked for the Roman army, but he was a Jew, captured slave. He said there was a crystalline canopy above the atmosphere, and this is in the first chapter, Josephus chapter one. So I think this has been historically always believed that there was a crystalline canopy above the atmosphere, which nobody could have possibly known. Uh, you're breathing in the mic again. Uh, but the, uh, they, they could, not, could not have seen such a thing or known such a thing. But if you had a crystalline canopy suspended by either air pressure or magnetic field, because super cold ice does become magnetic, and it levitates like the Japanese trains. They float them off the tracks with magnetic levitation. I don't know that. I don't know. It's gone. Okay, just be theoretical. 
But if there were a canopy squeezing the current 60 miles of air down to say 10 miles, you would have an increase of pressure at the surface of maybe 15, 20%, just again, just a guess. That would cause all kinds of interesting effects. Everything would, could breathe easier, things could grow larger. They would probably be 30% oxygen instead of 21%. And that's what the amber uh, air bubbles trapped in amber indicate that the air it used to contain 32 to 35 percent oxygen, which is absolutely optimum for life. You get more than that, you start to get problems, but up to 35 percent is, is wonderful. Ask any people working in a hospital or hyperbaric chamber. It's amazing to, to breathe high pressure air. Have you, or, ever heard or, of, have you ever heard of Wolfgang Pauli? I have. I don't know anything about it, but uh, yes, I've heard the name. Well, he had an expression. Uh, when one of his students would ask him something about physics that made absolutely no sense, that, that was completely bonkers and that had no correspondence even to a coherent thought, he would, he would look at them sadly and he would say, that's not even wrong. Kent, with all due respect, what you just told me right now is not even wrong. Neither is your idea of all that temperature being in a dot smaller than a period. That is dumb. Capital On what D, principle? Dumb. On what principle? Uh, Common sense. Where's all this temperature coming Kent, from? And how screw you your common it? sense. Tell me what physics prevented from happening. Well, what physics prevents a canopy from being above the atmosphere? When it comes to being above the atmosphere, there are a zillion things. I can't even get into them. Uh, I want to get back to the one that I was actually addressing with regard to the differentials in barometric pressure at different points. I'm telling you, even, even if you can get this thing to float, I'm not even magnetic field lines. Jesus. Even if this thing were viable uh, in the manner that you're trying to describe, the thing would not last. Uh, th these differences in pressure are going to cause, uh, are, are go the differences in the turbulent flows in different parts of the atmosphere are inevitably going to cause the entire thing to collapse, and it's going to happen very quickly. I mean, well, the, friction, the friction is going to change the temperature. The temperature is going to crack it and melt it. There's going to be thermal expansion. It's, 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 it's ridiculous. Come on. Watch the weather channel. You don't get the turbulent flows until there's low pressure. I tried to explain to you. With high pressure, this doesn't happen. Ask anybody with a hyperbaric chamber. There's probably one in your area. Most hospitals have one now. You change the dynamics by increasing the pressure. Some of the comments are coming up about taking questions, and I've got a 9 o'clock appointment in 12 minutes here. So uh, yeah, can let's, you... Let's, let's just get to the questions. Well... One of the questions that uh, I think we need to actually redress is that uh, when we're talking about the recombination period, Kent, and the fact that the, the Big Bang pre predicted the exact temperature of what the CMB should be around 5K, it actually ended up being about 2.725K. That is a novel prediction. So the question I have to ask is, is since that was a novel prediction that the Big Bang model did in fact predict prior to the discovery of it, why didn't creation science predict that? And how does that not help uh, confirm that the Big Bang model is a predictive model that works? Well, this goes back to King Crocodile Sinus' uh, lawyer model. Any lawyer will tell you two people can look at the same predictions or the same evidence and come with all kinds of different theories. Whoa, 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 whoa. predictions? No, 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 Kent. Evidence. Okay. They not look predictions. At, we look at the they're, same they're evidence. They're looking at the evidence. Okay. On. They're looking at the evidence after it materializes. The Big Bang Theory predicted the cosmic microwave background radiation before it was ever dreamed about. Okay, suppose in the movie... You have to explain why the... Hold on. Why was the, why was the Big Bang Theory capable of doing this? Why did it succeed in this? That doesn't make it true. Suppose in the movie, The Green Mile, they predicted the girls would be found dead with a black man. Oh, and yes, look at this. They're found dead with a black man. John Coffey's holding the dead girls. The, okay, the did they... Did, John Coffey made... didn't kill him. They, 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 they but is that how the movie went, Kent? Did they predict it beforehand, or did they find it afterward and then interpret it? You didn't listen. Sup I said, suppose they had predicted it. Suppose that... they had, then it would be a completely different story. Oh, then it would be true that John Coffey killed him. Come yeah, on. it's a different story at this point. It's a different story at this point. If, if for example, let's say that somebody got a tip-off that John Coffey was planning on murdering these two girls, and then uh, they had the time and the date and the exact manner in which it would happen, and then they find John Coffey, and it matches all of the associated predictions, then, yes, the evidence overwhelmingly supports his conviction in that case. 
But that's well, not what but, happened in the movie. Well, okay, so, okay, suppose they did predict. And suppose they had a letter from John Coffey, I'm going to kill these girls. They still wouldn't prove he did it. Any freshman but, law student could take that argument apart. Come on. But, but Kent, Wait, not you, letter, lawyer, Kent, get, get, hold on. We're not talking. I didn't I didn't say anything about a letter. Uh, th th I agree that just, just because of a person said that he did something doesn't mean that he actually did it. There has to be physical evidence. And I gave you an example of how this physical evidence w could potentially materialize and result in his conviction. Well, we've got questions waiting for us here, but I think uh, go back and re-listen to this and try to understand it. it. It is still possible for him not to have done it, even if it was predicted ahead of time that he'd be found with a black man. And back in the 30s and 40s, they blamed everything on the black people, a lot of things. So Okay, okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to play these rhetorical games. The fact of the matter is, uh, if you can make an accurate prediction using the physical evidence, the conviction is fully warranted. Black, white, green, purple, doesn't matter. Um, but that, the point that, is, that is ridiculous. That statement you just made is ludicrous. It doesn't prove anything. If they predicted things, there still could be multiple other options. But let's take the questions here. Kent, do, do, you, do you agree, though, that the model did successfully make a very novel prediction that creation science did not make? Do, do you acknowledge that? I, I don't know that to be true. I don't know what all predictions have been made by who. And what if, what if it turns out you. that... He, what he, if it turns out... The what prediction if it turns was... Out, okay, well, the prediction I, was I, the, we've been through all this. What if it turns out that one of those guys who made this prediction was a creationist, like the guy who invented the MRI machine. Whoa, he's a creationist. Okay, it makes no difference. It makes what no difference, difference does it make? That would, that would be an ad hominem, so what's your point? He still, exactly he still, correct. Used, what's he still point? used physics to do it. He still used conventional physics to make that prediction. Sure. Did he not? Okay, um, right, we'll go on the next question. Um, next question is by uh, The Living Dinosaur. Many of you guys may know him. He's been around for a long time. He is, he is back. Um, welcome back, Living Dinosaur. But this is not really specifically to this particular um, uh, discussion with physics, but I think it's a relative question. He says, please ask Kent, what's his justification for calling evolution a stupid religion? If you really believe it's religion, then why does you feel that it's, that it's acceptable to insult it? Do you, does that mean that you're okay with non-Christians insulting your religion? After all, wouldn't that make you a hypocrite if you if you think that it's okay to insult a religion? Oh, you want to just search the internet for Kent Hovind. You want to, people, you see, want to see people insulting my religion? Sure, it happens all the time. I can handle I got thick skin. Doesn't bother me at all. And yes, evolution, depending on which definition you use for the word, and I carefully clear, uh, divide it up into six categories, which it has to be divided to look at it. Uh, it does, five of them are purely religious. You have to believe in it, which is fine. You can believe in the Big Bang. I don't care. And you can interpret the evidence to mean that to take it as a scientific fact or part of your dogma. Every religion looks at things and says, aha, see, this, is, this proves our religion is true. I mean, all of them do that. <laughs> Another example of how a creationist steals from a scientist. Listen, Kent, this um, evolution, six different definitions thing, we went over this last time. I told you, uh, this is nonsense. Uh, evolution can be used to describe literally any phenomena that changes with respect to time. I told, I gave you an example of uh, how every undergraduate in physics has a textbook by Griffiths called Introduction to Quantum Mechanics, and how it has a section in it called the time evolution of the Schrodinger equation. Tell me, Kent, how does the time evolution of a Schrodinger equation fit into your six different types of evolution? Is this the seventh kind? What if I throw well, in new kinds? I mean, tell me, how, how does this come in? Well, we're supposed to be this taking, audience, you, we're taking audience questions here, but the evolution, cool. evolution yeah. means unrolling. The word literally means unrolling. It can be used for all sorts of things. The evolution of the automobile from the Model T to the Lincoln Continental. You can sure. use that word, but I give it in biological, in, in the t textbook. I show right straight from the textbooks that they teach uh, the six different meanings of evolution, cosmic, chemical, organic, which you have to get into stellar evolution. Nobody sees this. They believe it. We've never seen life come from non-living material, but that's that's organic evolution. It's in all the – Google Berkeley uh, – just Google organic evolution. It's on it's, Google it's all, evolution of the Schrodinger equation. Google evolution sure. of the birth control pill. Google evol sure. evolution – yeah, so you – The, the word means – Okay, that, so there's nothing, there's nothing special about these specific types of evolution. In print, you, you, select, you specifically select these uh, types of evolution, and you conflate them all. Uh, in order to make them guilty by association, apparently. So the, you said, we went over this, and therefore, because you did not agree with something I said, therefore, I'm wrong, you're right. But let's go back to the you audience questions it. here. All right, uh, next, next, uh, next question. Next okay. question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, next question is from uh, Helen Handbasket, um, for Casey, actually. Um, it is not extremely unusual for lay people to think of the Big Bang as an explosion. Can you explain in simple language why this is not an accurate view, what a better view is, and why it matters? And then Ken say whether he rejects or accepts your explanation. 
Well, explosions typically refer to a oxidation reactions, a sudden release. It's typically a chemical reaction that this is referring to, uh, rather than what's actually going on with the Big Bang Theory, where you have the expansion of the universe. Now, of course, the energy is, is expanding with it. And in principle, um, you know, there, there is this superficial resemblance to an explosion. Um, but in the same vein, I could say that flatulence is the release of energy uh, and that this also constitutes an explosion, which I suppose some could argue that it is. But, you know, when we think explosion, we don't typically mean flatulence. So, uh, yeah, anyway, the, the distinction matters because uh, you frequently have the straw man of, uh, you know, an explosion is not going to produce uh, a universe. It's like, okay, well, fine. If, if you're going to blow up a bomb and you expect a universe to emerge, you're an idiot. And if you think that other people expect it, then you are either committing a straw man or you, again, you're an idiot. Um, this is this is not what's being described by the Big Bang Theory. You have the expansion of the universe. Energy is moving outward. It's becoming less dense. It's becoming more cool. And you have the emergence of structures as a result of this cooling. Uh, so that's that's sort of the long and short of it. Well, I would, I would agree the word explosion can mean a number of things. The explosion of the population, the explosion of the number of cars on the street. Sure, the word, again, you got to define your terms. But the Big Bang is, I, I, I show in my seminar dozens of textbooks where they do teach it was an explosion of a dot smaller than a period on a page. And so if, if you want, I say a hand grenade, exactly the expansion of the metal fragments. It's not actually an explosion. It's the expansion of the metal fragments. Come on. It, it's talking about an explosion. And nobody's ever seen any expansion of materials reaccumulate why would the fragments of this explosion or this expansion big bang why would they accumulate into clumps like stars and galaxies why isn't it all just particles evenly distributed throughout all of visible space how do we have clumps gravity. of any matter anywhere gravity <laughs> come on ken this is basic I, physics gravity i, I understand uh, gravity i think is probably as well as anybody uh yes and i'm using it right now actually sitting on a chair so uh Yes, gravity. So these particles that are flying away from each other, assumingly, assuming in a radial direction from this expansion, they're going to reaccumulate. Some the further you go away, the f the farther apart they get, but they're going to somehow find each other and pull each other together, even though they're continually expanding, getting further apart. I think it's common sense 101 to say that's not logical. The fragments should be spread everywhere. So the question was... Yeah, again with the common sense. Kent, they did this experiment in space. They went into the International Space Station. They took these particles. Uh, I think it was sand or, or dust or something along the lines of the, uh, along those lines. And they, 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 moved, they shook them around. Uh, and they saw that they spontaneously accumulated, even though they were, they were, they were, they were going in every direction. Well, yeah, um, out in space, I agree. That's where Uranus came from, the, uh, you know, dumping the urine overboard on the space, uh, early space flights. It followed, this, followed the space capsule because uh, that's the strongest, <laughs> the biggest attraction and the biggest show in town was the thing right there. So, yeah, that's... Okay, uh, the, the point is, even if things are moving apart uh, in a vacuum, the gravity is going to pull them together. Casey, let me, let me ask you as a follow-up to this. Would you say, though, an explosion is typically something ex something increasing in a unit volume of space while the Big Bang was the volume of space that was expanding itself? That's why they it actually is not an explosion. But for the laypersons, for an analogy, they call it an explosion, but you'll never see that terminology used in actual scientific literature. Yeah, it's a good point. If you if you think of conventional explosions in terms of, you know, somebody detonating TNT, you have the motion of objects through space. Um, whereas with the Big Bang, what you actually have are objects embedded in their positions in space. Of course, they can move around. Um, but the expansion of the universe is is not causing it to move with respect to the space. The expansion of the universe is causing them to move away with respect to each other. And for an analogy for how you can have uh, how, how you can have this take place. Uh, you can imagine a cake with raisins embedded inside of it in, in three dimensions. Um, you, put the, you put the raisins in the dough and then you put the dough inside of the oven and you heat it up. And as you heat it up, uh, the dough begins to expand and it carries the raisins with it. Now the raisins are not moving with respect to the dough. They're moving with respect to each other, but that's because the dough is expanding. The raisins themselves are not moving with respect to the dough. Uh, so that, that would be the difference. This would be the analogy of the Big Bang. Whereas the analogy of a conventional explosion, the, the raisin is inside of there and then it suddenly pops and it, and it moves to other parts of the parts of the cake. Uh, so that's, that's, that's sort of, that's a significant difference. 
we got about five minutes left, so let's go ahead and, and do your closing statements. Um, normally, Kent, do you go last? Do you want to go uh, first this time? Oh, it does not matter. Uh, let let the uh, young fellow just do whatever he wants. What would you like? Uh, you, you go ahead, Kent. Well, I believe, as I started off saying, that the Bible is literally true. There is plenty of evidence the universe cannot possibly be billions of years old. Looking at the Big Bang or the Red Shift or the... Uh, cosmic background radiation can easily be explained by exactly what the Bible taught, even though it may be that an uh, evolutionist or an atheist even uh, discovered this cosmic background radiation. Oh, well, I'm sorry that some creationist or some Christian or some Bible believer didn't discover it first, that it may be true. Still doesn't have anything to do with proving evolution is true. Uh, <clears throat> so I think uh, the position uh, for uh, Pascal's wager that uh, my, my position is perfectly safe and fine. I, either way, I win one way you lose and we're i think that you you have to wonder if we are indeed nothing but uh you know particles uh that it came from an explosion or an expansion of the universe your mind then would be nothing but a bunch of mat material from this space dust and i'm not sure how you can trust your own thoughts or your reasoning processes or conclusions you come to it may have a chemical in there backwards uh, so you're trusting your own logic and intuition which intuitively is untrustworthy because it's nothing but random chemicals formed by chance over billions of years. So I've seen nothing tonight or in any of our discussions or debates to make me want to reject the clear teaching of God's word that he did it in six days. And it's only, well, I say only, only is a bad word. 6,000 is a long time. Uh, 6,000 years ago is a long time, but that's what the Bible clearly teaches. And I think that everything we see in space or on the planet or in the planet can be explained by the clear teachings of God's word. So I think I'll stick with my Bible. And Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. I, I believe he was right. And Jesus clearly said, and uh, all through the Bible, we see there's going to be a judgment day one day. Every word we've ever spoken is going to be brought into account. There's something innate in humans to want to see the bad guy get it in the movies. You know, the guy who's going around killing people, you say, man, somebody ought to stop him. I think that just the fact that that's innate in us is indication that there's something of a moral conscience that had to be embedded by the creator because he is going to uh, settle all scores. The bad guy is going to get it. Uh, it's according to the Bible. There will be a judgment day. There'll be a test at the end of this. And uh, we're, all this whole conversation will be replayed every word. Only this time God himself will be the judge and answer all the questions if you, if you really want one. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stick with my Bible. I think it's literally true. And I think it's uh, at least, it leads to a wonderful society if everybody tries to follow that. Certainly makes you better fathers, uh, uh, better husbands, better brothers. I think it, it, it. I think the evolution theory that we're just random particles is going to lead to chaos in society. If everybody believed that, I think it would lead to absolute chaos. But that's a different topic of the moral implications of what you believe versus what I believe. But I think scientifically, everything can be explained exactly like I showed you from God said 17 times he stretched out the universe. That's what he said. Okay. All right, thank you. Go ahead, KC. Okay. Well, I'm just going to really briefly address this chaos in societies where people accept evolutionary theory and, and science. I, I mean, this is, with all due respect, this is the height of intellectual cowardice. Look at the people on my screen and tell me that it's conceivable that a person can hide behind their Bible and say that the scientific matter has something to do with morality. This, this conflation uh, is, is it's, it's distasteful. Chaos in societies which accept scientific theories. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, Kent, but uh, you know, if you compare, for instance, uh, Japan to Saudi Arabia, um, and compare the people who accept evolutionary theory in one, uh, you know, it, 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 anywhere in the Middle East, very religious places, um, you're you're going to and compare it to you know these these other societies. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned Japan, and I could mention. United Kingdom, uh, for a time, I could mention, I, I could mention any number of them. Um, the point is, we're not your prediction that you see more chaos in a society that accepts uh, the science. It's 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 simply not true. Um, but the main point I want to make is actually on this part right here. Um, you 
came up with a straw man just now about how the, the, the supposedly because an evolutionist discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation, suddenly it's this. This was not the argument at all. Look at the first part of this. A scientific theory's strength relies on its predictive power. How accurately does it make novel, testable predictions about future data? And I think that you and I have both come to agree, even though you you don't think that this makes it a good model, even though you know it kind of does. Uh, the fact that this was predicted exclusively by the Big Bang Theory and that this was done exquisitely over the course of several decades um, lends more strength to the Big Bang Theory than the Young Earth Creationist model has ever had. Uh, so I'm sorry, but you simply don't have a leg to stand on. Compare what I have brought to the table um, in terms of, it's, it's not just the interpretation of evidence, it's, it's the actual prediction of data that we have at our disposal. All right, we're, we're not looking at the same evidence and interpreting it differently. We predicted what evidence we should be interpreting in the first place, okay? This, this, is, this, is, this is not at all um, a level playing field. So that's all I have to say about that. Thanks, Casey. Well, we're gonna wrap this up. Um, I wanna thank both our debaters tonight, King Crocoduck and Ken Hoven, and to all of you who watched this debate. Um, I also want to shout out to Paula Gia, who produced a magnificent trailer to promote this debate, as well to uh, Godless Cranium, who also helped promote this, promote, uh, this event on his uh, channel. If you haven't subscribed to either of their channels, please do so, as they have both have extremely wonderful content, very much worth watching, and the links to their channels are below. So please go subscribe to them as well. Subscribe to uh, King Crocoduck and Ken Holman on Ken Holman Official. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of these debates and join the conversation, the link to join the Great Debate Community is also in the links below. And there will be an after show in about 20 minutes or so on this channel, and all are welcome to join. And we will see you then. Thanks, everybody, for watching.